Well, good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to the third in the Continuous Cover Forestry Group series of webinars, which <coughs> all have dealt with different aspects of applying continuous cover forestry in Britain. I'm Bill Mason. I'm the chair of the CCFG, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to this afternoon's webinar. Today's presentation will be given by Gareth Browning from Forestry England, based in the Lakes. Gareth's talk will last about 30 minutes and we'll then have a, roughly the same length of time for questions. Please enter your questions into the chat box. As you probably know, the webinar will be recorded and it should be available on our website in a few days time. A few words about Gareth and then that'll be- all lies. Action. So Gareth looks after the forests and valleys around Keswick, Cockermouth and Annadale in a beautiful part of Northwest England. He's had over 30 years of working in North Cumbria. And in that time, he's built up considerable experience in managing forests on steep ground with high public access, high public visibility, and the need to maintain access for recreation and other aspects. He's been using continuous cover techniques on steep ground and with large trees since the mid 1990s. A number of us were fortunate enough to attend a CCFG visit to some of his forests in May 2019, and he prepared a set of useful guidance notes based on his experience in the CCFG summer 2019. And I think with that, Gareth, I'll hand over to you. Thank you, Bill. Thank you everybody for joining. I hope uh, this is interesting to you and look forward to the questions. I'm going to share the awful PowerPoint experience. Uh, I tried to, I was going to do a, a video version with some video from the forest, but as I was telling Bill, I managed to double book today along with my colleagues from Wild Ennerdale and we've actually got three presentations between us today. So I ran out of time to put the video together and I only managed the video for the other presentation this morning. So I'm afraid you've got slides, but they're all pictures. Uh, if you want the text, uh, I'm quite happy to say, make a PDF of it and send it to Michelle and she can distribute the PDF with the notes. But um, This is all slides because I'm a great fan of pictures. So let me try and share this. We've tried, tried it once and it worked. Hopefully it'll work again. Can you see that, Michelle? Bill? Yep, see you fine. Okay, so here we go. I can hear quite a bit of background noise from somebody. I don't know who that is. That's better. So welcome to North Cumbria. This is a view looking down over Bass and Thwaite Lake in the winter. It doesn't look like that at the moment, but that just gives you a sense of where I am. In, I'm in the forest uh, Withup, which is just beside Bass and Thwaite Lake. Gareth, we haven't got the picture yet. Ah. Oh, I know, because I haven't operated it, because I've got... That's covering it, that's why. I clicked on it, but it didn't click on it. Is that better? Yeah, that's grand. So this is uh, from winter. Uh, we're looking across at Doddwood and on the side of Withup Forest and Bass and Thwaite Lake. And uh, the talk I'm giving this afternoon really comes from our experiences of managing both these forests. And the photos are from both these forests. So I'm hoping to share with you some experience of managing steep sites and big trees across two of our forests at Withup and Dodd around Bass and Thwaite Lake. These have all been thinned twice in the last eight years. and. Uh, you know, really we're starting to learn a lot about how to manage these woods just by thinning and doing things on the ground. So I thought to start with, I'd maybe define what we mean, what I'm meaning by steep ground and big trees. And it's a it's very simple definition, but for me, steep sites are slopes we cannot, which cannot be extracted by forwarder. Simple as that. And for big trees, I'm meaning trees that can't easily be felled by a harvester. So I hope you can all sign up to those definitions. So this is a view of our site at Withup. If any of you have been to our office at Peel Wyke, you'll have driven through this part of the forest. So this is a group system uh, with underplanting as underplanting. And what I'm going to do is try and uh, take you through some of the sites in both Withup and Dodd, and then summarize the sort of challenges and experiences of working on the steep ground and big trees from these sites. So first off is going to be a bit of a general description, and then towards the end, I'll summarize the main challenges and experiences that we've had. 
So this is a north facing slope and uh, because it's very damp, we don't actually get regeneration of uh, Douglas fir. It's too damp for the spring germination of Douglas fir, so we end up underplanting a lot. And that's quite interesting, managing a, 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 a system through underplanting. The last thinning we did removed about 30 to 50 percent of the trees at each re and we've done that twice now in eight years so what you're looking at is post the last thinning and for each thinning we've identified frame trees and trees to be removed which were marked by myself and my work supervisor the trees in the background are 20 rolled under plantings which are now being thinned so we're now thinning the layer underneath and we're continuing with some group clear felling. It's a sort of mix of group clear felling and thinning. And we use the group felling to create space where we can land the big crowns of the big trees. And potentially we can also, once we've decided we don't need that anymore for that purpose, we can then underplant in those areas, as well as underplanting in amongst the trees in between racks. another picture looking at another part of the site this with uh, this has regeneration uh, has underplanting groups in it but you can't see them because all now green at the same color of the bracken and heather uh, bracken and ferns they were quite visible but unfortunately i took this picture last week and they've all gone green so the underplanting we do we're trying to group them around the marked frame trees because by doing so i'm hoping that Having the, a mark around this frame tree, so we paint a circular mark around the frame tree to indicate it is an important tree and we want the harvesting team to protect it, not land trees into it, and not fell it. By putting underplanting around the actual frame trees, we hope that that gives the underplanting protection. But we you also do other things, so we also mark on the, we've marked on the tree stems, the letter R and an arrow to point out where regeneration is that maybe the machines won't see because it's still under the vegetation layer. Going further into Withup, this is what we call Withup Main. And this is a, a steeper site. So the site before had big trees on a flat site. This is a steep site uh, and not so big trees. So if these trees were on a flat site, you could easily handle them with machinery, but because of the steepness of the site, machinery can't get on to do the work. So in Withup Main, although they're not large trees yet, we, we still have to treat it differently because of the steepness. So I thought this was maybe a useful point to talk about the type of th approach we have to thinning uh, on steep ground. And this links quite a bit with what Phil was saying at the last um, presentation that CCFG hosted. But we're really aiming at protecting stability. That's one of the big aims I have because we're in West Cumbria and we have a windy climate. So I'm looking to make, remain, retain, sorry, looking to remove no more than 20% of the crop in any intervention. So first and second thinnings, what do they look like? Well, this is looking down a, a first thinning after it's been thinned. This is actually below the road. And uh, what looks like a green down there is actually the A66. So it's very close to the bottom of the A66. And we have to close the A66 for around two to three months when we thin this uh, forest. We have to close one side of the dual carriageway. So the first and second thinnings are simply organizational, working out how much of the site can be reached, reducing basal area and protecting uh, stability. So this is a first thin we're looking at. So first thin or late or delayed subsequent thin after canopy closures. So some of the crops we've gone back into haven't been thinned at the right stage for a variety of reasons. And I've inherited them in 2010 when I took over this forest. And so we've gone and done a first thing often when they're even 30, 35 years old. So what we've been doing is a one in eight thinning uh, where we take one row out of every eight. So at least seven in between. That adds up to about 12.5% of the crop. So that leaves us 7.5% that we could thin either side. So if I think it's stable enough, I can thin another 7.5% of the basal area per hectare either side. Because the, the row in eight is taking out 12.5%. Can't, it can't change that. If it's more very stable, I might thin both the first row either side and the second row. So you could go down here and uh, let me just, uh, so you could take out say that tree and you could take out that tree and you might take out that tree and then you might reach back in and take out a couple behind it as well. If it's a really stable site, you might take that tree as well and something like this. 
if it's not very stable, if I'm worried about stability, all I'll do is the rack. I'll just do the rack and that's it, nothing else. So when we come back to the second thinning, we've already done one set of racks. It's not quite as clear as I'd like it to be on this, this bit image, but um, it's just the way it is. When you take photos, you don't get the same view as you do with your eye. So there is actually a, a rack in here, a rack in here, there's a rack there, and there's another rack just in there. And roughly speaking, it's not perfect. I don't know why it is, but some of our contractors don't seem to count one to eight sometimes, or sometimes it's just regeneration mixed up with regeneration. And you can't see the rows very well. But the aim here is that what we've gone and done in the second thing is we've taken the alternate row in between. So, that, so say this was the first thin racks here and here, we've then taken out a rack in between. And again, if it's stable, we might thin in between that rack. If it's not very stable, we just take that rack out. And the real advantage of this is that on steep slopes, everything is costly. The first and second thinnings are very costly on steep slopes. So if you can make it simple for the Skyline team uh, as often as possible, so doing a rack gives you a nice clump of uh, volume, a nice length of volume all in one place, relatively easy to get out. And you can do it again in your second thin. Again, you get a load of easy to get volume. Once you start going either side, it gets harder because trees get hung up. Yeah. Um, so we then move on to the third thinning. Oh, sorry, that's a subsequent thing. So we then move on to third thinning. And uh, there we can start to introduce intermediate thinning. So we've got these racks in place then. We don't want to take any more out in between. What we do is go up. We'll turn it rack. Sorry? I'm still on the second thinning. Yeah, that's right. I haven't got a third thinning slide. All oh, right, sorry. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> I'm just using this to do both. Okay, cheers. So yeah, in the third thing, um, we've we've got these racks all in place now, so we can go up any of them and intermediate, but I'd probably just ask them to go up either side and thin either side. It just depends on the crop. You can't be too specific because it depends on the crop and how stable you feel it is. But we've got options to go up and down all of them if we want and thin either side from there. Uh, and the way our, our thinning team have worked this is they've got really good at it. So they, they will put the rack in first. Um, and then as they're taking the rack up, as they're actually pulling the trees out, they will thin the trees either side as they're pulling the rack. And what that means is they will fell. So say the, the brat, they're actually pulling out a tree here from this rack. So they've got a tree lying there. They're going to pull that out. If they're going to take a tree out next to it, they maybe take that tree out there. They will fell that backwards. It'll get hung up. The cable comes up from the skyline, they connect it to that and they connect it to that. And so when the skyline pulls, it actually pulls that hung up tree out at the same time. So at no point to the, the people felling the trees, actually the winchman, chokerman is felling the tree for the thinning, but he's not having to bring it down. The skyline is bringing it out at the same time as pulling out of the rack. And I thought it's a really clever system. It does work really well and reduces their manual handling because they're not having to try and pull the trees down themselves. So then we get to subsequent thinnings and, and they can be four, fifth, six, depends on how many times you thin, but you're certainly talking a fourth and a, a fifth probably. Um, and this is where you start to get much wider spacing, trees start to get more valuable. So this is where we probably start introducing uh, our frame trees. So these would be trees that we want to keep for a long time, they're the framework of the forest. So we would mark them all round with paint so they can be seen from all directions, like this tree on the right here, maybe. And then uh, we'd start marking the trees to come out. It's not a very good image, but if we said we, we wanted to keep this one as a frame tree, can't see the crown of it on here. This one's clearly been damaged, so we want that out. So we put a, a diagonal mark on that, and we might take the one below it out as well. So we'd mark around the frame tree the trees we want to come out. So at this stage, subsequent thinning, we've got lower and lower tree density, more less trees to make changes if we get it wrong. This is when we start to intervene uh, ourselves as foresters and work supervisor and start marking the trees. Prior to this, we wouldn't mark the trees. Uh, it would all be fellow select and the instructions that we're giving. Now we can just mark the frame tree. So we put a circle around the frame trees and walk through and just mark frame trees and give a set of instructions to how many trees to take out. So how many of these trees would we take out per frame tree? And again, we're still aiming at that 20%. And taking the numbers of trees out per frame tree, I found our contractors understand much better than saying, I want 
75 cubic meters per hectare out or 46 cubic meters per hectare or something like that or a, or a percentage of basal area if i work that out beforehand and, and, and get it right then i can just say to them i want for each frame tree i want the most competing co-dominant to dominant tree out or two co-dominants and then just take out anything under the canopy that's not going to survive into the next thinning and they, they really understand that well and i find that works well so this is the sort of subsequent thinning and that might go on a couple of thinnings where we're just doing that until we start to see regeneration uh, this is the this is a view actually from Winlatter of uh, an area of hemlock that's regenerating quite profusely having had only one thin but quite a heavy thinning very stable actually quite good timber for hemlock so in the regeneration phase we start to switch our attention not all our attention but some of our attention to the to where the regeneration is but we carry on marking frame trees we mark a frame tree we say right that one wants to come out where's the nearest dominant or co-dominant mark that as well so we're getting regeneration really all that's telling us is we do everything right we must not get too fixated on this regeneration and so we must keep all that it's fine if some of that is lost you can see how much hemlock regeneration we've got anyway so we're going to have to keep reducing that overstory and that's so key we must keep thinning mustn't fixate on the regeneration must keep thinning keep the frame trees mark the trees to come out keep opening up the frame trees because we want them to be really stable big grounds to keep dropping more seed and we want them to be genetically really good straight and, and good quality so they produce the right seeds but what we're seeing on the ground is just telling us we're getting it right it's not necessarily the trees that we need to grow into the next layer because our frame our, our, our overstory stocking is still too high to start putting too much effort into this layer Um, let's see if I could cover everything there. Oh yes, just one more thing to say then. So, as we develop these frame trees, um, we're, we're still looking at the stable, you know, having a stable crop. Interestingly, people often say, "So, what do you do in the areas that you're going to clear for?" Well, actually, we treat all our. I'm treating all our thinning the same. I'm treating it all as if it's CCF. Even the areas that aren't CCF, I'm still thinning the same because it's simpler people my contractors understand it if we use the same approach everywhere this type of thinning approach with frame trees is good for stability well that's good for areas that are going to be thinned with a clear fell endpoint but it also gives me the opportunity that potentially some areas might move into ccf as they are thinned you might look at them and think actually this could be ccf let's let's move it on the forest design plan and it also offers us the opportunity to introduce other species so in with it we've tried felling uh, two tree length chevron shapes in the middle of two racks difficult to explain but in between two racks we felled a chevron shape so that the trees above and below can still be felled out into the racks without hitting the regen or under planting and in, and then we're under planting different species in those chevrons to get a different species into the mix so just thinking about stability a bit more this is a view from Witham improving crop stability is a priority for all our sites as climate change shows future storms will increase in speed and frequency stability of trees on steep slopes is even more critical as wind blow cannot be can be too dangerous to work manually and no option for wheeled machinery especially if you combine with big trees on steep slopes here's an example here where we've clear felled an area next to ccf big trees i thought well they they look like they can stand they're nice big trees lots of big rooting unfortunately the following uh, winter, we had the beast from the east hit us with 70 mile an hour winds and they all had snow frozen in their canopies. So they had a couple of tons of snow in the canopies frozen and we had a bit of a, quite a bit of wind blow, unfortunately. And you can see this gets quite challenging on a steep slope. So these trees are on a really steep slope, fallen over down slope. Not really much you can do with them. Can't get a machine to them, can't put a man underneath them. We've lost that so we really want to make sure that what we're doing is stable and I'm, i've learned lessons from that certainly so moving on to the uh, last two inventions they're aimed at significantly reducing the overstore whilst protecting the understory so we're always trying to reduce the overstory and protect the understory so here we are in with it now we've got an established overstory that's coming up uh, sorry understory that's coming up We've got overstory trees, so you can see there's a paint mark around that one. So that's been a frame tree. Um, 
so the frame trees are and the, and the remaining trees are well spread out now understories coming up not quite thinning size yet and partly the reason i'm not thinning the understory is because i still feel the overstory is too dense and i don't want to put effort and time into the understory only to land an overstory tree on it but because this is flat ground although we've got big trees this is flat ground we've got these permanent extraction racks now so you can see them going off in different directions and that gives us space we can land crown, the crowns of big trees into. The stem of a big tree is actually not that wide and if you get it right you can get it between other trees. So here's an example, this is a big tree, this is the region around it, they felled it out that way and no damage to the understory at that point of felling. What's important is where you land the crown. So having permanent extraction racks and big trees is really useful because you can land the crowns into the open extraction racks. But also bear in mind that you want to get that overstory down so you don't have to keep doing this and managing the understory. So at the moment, I haven't thinned this because I'm still concerned that we might hit some of these trees and I don't want to reduce my options by thinning it. Moving on to Doddwood. On the other side of the lake now, excuse me, I'll have a drink. Doddwood is a well-established two-story Douglas fir forest on a steep slope. So we've got big trees and the steep slope now and regeneration. So we get regeneration over in Dodd where we don't on wither. Dodd is a south-facing dry slope, ideal for Douglas fir. Regeneration started in the mid-1990s. Uh, when I first saw it, it was angle to knee high. I think I was with um, probably uh, Neville Geddes, if you want. Neville. Um, and the last two th and the last two things we've done over the last eight years have focused on significantly reducing the overstory stocking in response to evidence that much of the understory was running out of space to grow up. So the understory was actually hitting the overstory canopy or just being crowded out by the, the canopy overstory. So we really focused on reducing the overstory density, um, taking 30 to 40 percent out at a time. And you can see some of that in this picture. This is uh, the last thing we did. And again, you've got both things going here. Big trees, you've got to get them between the regeneration. So all this, all you can see over here, this stuff in here, that's all understory regeneration. None of it's planted. And then you've got these big trees. So where you land the crown is really important. Getting it through the understory is actually not that difficult, but landing the big crowns are really important. So talking to the contractors, we, we came up with a system. And uh, we'll move another slide on. So how was this harvested? Working with the main contractor, I explained what I wanted as part of the pre-sale discussion. In addition to the CCF prescription, the site has a limited space for timber stacking and dispatch. So the main contractor and operators came up with a three-phase approach, which I agreed with. Phase one was to fell space in the understory for the overstory crowns. We created these sort of half scallops. There's another one back there where we, we took the understory out to create space for the overstory felling. We extracted that, dispatched it, and then came back for phase two, which was to thin the overstory. So this, this space here is where a crown from behind me is gonna land, or multiple crowns will land without damaging an understory. We felled, did that, thinned the overstory, extracted that, dispatched it and then came back and did phase three, which was to thin the understory, putting racks up in a standard first thinning pattern for the understory. And I, and I have to say they did really well, and this is it post thinning. And you know we took 30, 40% of the overstory out and thinned the understory, and it looks really good. All right, Gareth, that's about 20 minutes. Thank you. And it's really heartening to see that both understory and overstory have survived the, the storm winds we've had over the last two years. And even more in, uh, inspiring, you can just about see it in this picture that, that we've got regeneration as well. So we've got a third layer. Again, this is early regeneration. We don't have to keep it. It's just telling us we're doing things right. So I want to summarize the challenges and our experiences of working with steep ground. Big trees, big canopies, they impact the understory. This is the understory regen in Dodd. Under, this is the second story, this is the third story, and you can see a couple of big trees. So large crowns hinder and block physically the growth of the understory upwards, and large crowns block out light to the understory. 
They're also um, you know, just very big to get down, but we'll come on to that. So, and you'll get this a lot when I talk, just keep thinning. You've got to keep thinning. That overstory has to come down. If you're getting regeneration and it's growing, you're doing everything right, but don't stop thinning the overstory. Keep thinning the overstory. Remember, seedlings are easily replaced. At this age, you've not input, you not put any energy into this. It's all free. You hit that with a big brand, a big uh, Douglas fir stem or extracting trees through it. It doesn't matter. There's more seedlings on the way if you're doing the right thing. If you've still got the big trees dumping seed, you can lose these. And there's thousands of them if you're doing it right. So it doesn't matter. What you don't want to be doing is smashing this established understory that's 20, 30, 25 years old. You want to keep that and protect it. So don't stop thinning. Competent and resource contractors. That's a real challenge in CCF anyway, but steep ground CCF very much so. So working with big trees and steep slopes requires competent, experienced contractors. What have we done? Well, one thing we've done is set up a long-term contract that's allowed us to develop a partnership with local contractors and encourage them to invest in machinery and people. And they've got to know our sites and they know what we want. And by having simple systems to describe what we want, they can they can start understanding it. So if they, I would hope by now, if they looked at us uh, a part of our forest, they will often say, oh, we thinned that last time, didn't we, Gareth? We put a one line in because it was first thinning so i guess you want another line in between or well, we did the two lines now you want us to intermediate thin so they start to get what we want we've simplified the thinning approach uh, and we've got contractors who are, are starting to get to know all our forests we have a 10-year long-term contractor long-term contract with euroforest and that's made a big difference to thinning these sites we sell based on weight so I, we only do b6 plots and when i sell the the when I put the timber up for sale, it's called a single bid tender. So Euroforest bid against our valuation every year. And if they don't achieve more than our reserve, then we offer it on the open market where they could bid again. But this gives us time as foresters to actually mark, think about marking the lower density trees that are most expensive and most valuable. And what we do is we mark those after we've sold the timber. So through the year, I'm marking trees as the contractors move through, discussing with them what I want and marking ahead of them. And that means I, I'm not doing any mensuration. I'm simply focused on what trees should come out. Mensuration is done by the B6 plots and their valuation is based on that, not the mensuration that would come from all the trees because it's just too costly and takes too long. So I'm doing the marking as the contract progresses and they've trusted me in their valuation of how I've described it. And I provide them with a spreadsheet with all the, the sort of details of what I'm expecting to come out of each subcompartment. There might be over a hundred of them in each year. Stability is the priority. Here's one of my chevrons. I must go back and see if it's still standing, but we've we've taken a chevron out of here and started under plant to get some different species in. The climate is becoming stormier and more, uh, more to come with climate change. High wind speed events are increasing, both frequency and impact. Wind blow trees on steep slopes, very difficult to deal with. And they can fall anywhere, so you're not in control of what happens. They could damage your understory. So our experience has been really to thin early and keep thinning, use stability index to determine when and, and what type of thinning to do. So if you haven't come across it, stability index is simply uh, dividing the top height of the, or you can do the top height of the tree divided by the mean DBH. Typically I do it both in centimeters. You can map this if you've got GIS and it get, helps you visualize where your stable and unstable crops are. If your stability cone depth comes out between 0 and 50, it's very stable. You can pretty much do what you want. They should be all individually stable, subject to things like the bees from the east. If it comes out between 50 to 80-ish, then they're still stable. You could do more than 20%, um, they should be fine. 80 to 100, minutes. thank you, Bill. 80 to 100, they're becoming more unstable. So you wanna consider maybe just sticking to the 20% removal. Once you go over to 100, which is typical actually for first thinning, uh, most of my first thinning sites come out with a stability factor of somewhere between 100 and 120. So there you might think of just doing a line thin, which is 12.5% removed, maybe just thinning the next the, the row either side. On flat sites, you could you know, reach in a bit further. Once you get above 120 stability index, well, it's becoming very unstable, might not be sensible to try and thin it and, and look at clear fill options. 
unless you're on really, really stable soils and know that there's a lot of shelter for that site, I would start to think about not thinning. Exemptions to this are, as I said, first thinnings often over 100 and very big trees often like those big Douglas fir, they just don't fit this system, but by then it doesn't matter, they're very stable. Steep ground equals, uh, sorry, that was another picture. So steep ground equals straight lines. This is a picture from Withup. You, steep ground is straight lines. You can't do anything else. So we've developed this system uh, for doing the first and second interventions using a one in line, eight line thinning, and then alternating again. And that keeps the cost down as best we can on an expensive site and generates volume that's easy for the skyline to get to. And we explained how they've made it come up with a system where the skyline extracts the thinning trees that are hung up as they go down the, the, uh, the rack. They actually pull out the hung up trees. Felling big trees, well, that needs big machinery and that needs investment. This is a big cat skidder. I have a thing, my memory is very poor, but I think it's got a 20 ton winch capacity and it weighs 25 tons or something like that. It's uh, it's pretty big, but it needs to be. We've got trees varying between seven and ton tons each, so we need a big machine, and that needs investment. So these competent, skilled directional felling, and you need to thin this overstory regularly, and reduce those big trees down to a low density, so that when your regeneration starts coming up through, then you've got less trees that can do damage when they're felled. Well, thin big trees should then be individually stable, so you can increase your thinning yield to 30, 40, 50 percent to, to really speed up the reduction of the overstory and generate you a lot of income. Don't get precious about that first wave of regeneration. Keep thinning that overstory. If you get precious about the regeneration, you stop thinning the overstory, they get too big and you run out of space for that regeneration to, climb, to grow into. Remember, just remember to keep thinning. Another option is to consider a group system where the small clear fells are used to provide space for the crowns to be landed in. A bit like we do on Dodd, create some clear fell, small clear fells, one or two tree lengths in diameter, and then you can fell that year's trees into them, into that clear fell, and land all the crowns in there. Thank you for listening. It's a bit of a rush through, I'm afraid, but we've got half an hour questions. A few final thoughts. If you haven't heard it already and you haven't started thinning, then start thinning. If you have started thinning, then keep thinning. Try and regularly thin every four to six years. Sounds easy, but I have to say it's only because we've got a long-term contract that I manage that because I have to prepare something for the long-term contract every year. So that forces me to thin, which is good practice. And also remember, like humans in the human world, Parents need to make space for their children to grow. So you have to thin those big trees. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Gareth. That's great. Lovely set of pictures. Um, I'm just going to try and stop sharing now. Oh, okay. that's not to do that. Wait for you to stop sharing, and then we'll get on with the question. How do I do that now? Oh, there you go. Okay. Uh, first one um, is to do with the prof the overall profitability of the exercise, particularly when you places like with it where you've got to close the main road. Um, yep. Road maintenance. How does all this work out? Well, uh, we're in year eight of the long term contract now, and I touched on it in the presentation. We've developed what I call whole forest thinning. So we thin every thinnable crop in the forest when we when we thin the forest. So when we're in Withup, we thin all the crops that we can thin. When we're in Dodd, we do the same when we're in Winata. So everything from first thinning right up to the mature big trees, we thin it all. And every year, the price we get back is different, but it's a standing sale. We can't sell a standing sale at a negative. So every year it's always been positive. And in fact, Withup is, is a really good positive because we've got those big trees in the mix. Um, the last time we did Withup, some of those big trees were being exported, believe it or not, to Hamburg for port infrastructure and to Chicago. Um, that's how valuable they are. 
So if you've got that mix in the in the if you've got that mixed approach to whole forest, it's the only way to get the first thinning and second thinning done, as far as I can see, because they are definitely a loss. You couldn't do them on their own. They, you'd have to pay somebody. So mixing the whole lot together and having a mixed looking at the whole forest and doing everything together, that's how we managed to do it. And that includes the cost of the closure. So the closure, a two month closure on the A66 costs around eighty thousand pounds. We actually get a a price from uh, our Euroforest get a price from a contractor to do that. They share it with us, and we both build in that cost. So we're both being honest about how much that costs, and it's still profitable to do it. Okay, thanks. Um, following on a little bit with the Euroforest aspect. Sorry, I should have said, Bill. Sorry, one other thing. As part of that whole forest thinning, we do also include a clear fell or two to help the process. So, not all of these forests are continuous cover. There are still bits that are not suitable to CCF. So we've got some clear fells to help with that process. And that's, I think, part of the the plan is you 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 all thin everything you can, work out what do I need to support that thinning, and and have a bit of a clear fell in the system. And we've got clear fells in our forest because. We've got forests that are high altitude exposed or just haven't been thinned enough. And it helps you diversify the species going forward, having some clear fells. Okay. Um, <clears throat> I think I know the answer to this, but um, the Euroforest, do they use the same contractors each year? Yes. So that's part of building up experience and continuity. Yeah, they've used the same main contractor from the beginning. Um, the contract team on the ground changed over years two and three, but since then we've had the same individuals as well, which is what we're looking for. Okay. Um, again, going might be worth just saying a little bit more to people about how you identify the frame trees. Because yeah. one of the questions are coming up that are linked to that. So it does depend on the stage you decide to start frame trees at. So the earlier in the age of the tree, the, the, the coop. So remember, we've got multiple coops across these forests. They're, different, they're all at different ages. And we've started to transform them to CCF at a point when they're all at different ages. So we're starting to transform some that are first thinning age, some that are fifth or sixth thinnings, 70, 80 years old. So in the younger crops, if we say went in at 40, 50, we might look at 100 frame trees per hectare. In older crops, we might look at 50 frame trees per hectare. So you start with the numbers of frame trees per hectare is important. That will give you a spacing. And so to try and spread those trees out so we don't spread, have them all in one place, we pace out the spacing. So for 50 frame trees per hectare, it's about 16 meters. So we'd start in one corner of the, of the coop and walk 16 meters, step pace 16 meters. If we see a frame tree along the way that's really good, that we just think that has to be a frame tree, we'll mark that and then we'll start at 16 meters again. If after 16 meters we don't find a frame tree, we carry on walking until we find one. There's no point marking one just because we've got to 16 meters. We will carry on until we find a, frame, a, a tree that's a frame tree. So in terms of specification for a frame tree, we're looking for a co-dominant or a dominant, typically. So that's trees that are very much in the canopy. They're up in the canopy. They're either co-dominants or dominants in that canopy. Then look at the form. Are they genetically good trees? Because we're going to get seed from them. We want them to produce good offspring that we can use that's going to produce good timber. Then look at the buttressing, especially on spruce. Um, you can see buttressing, and that's a good indication of anchorage roots being put out that will hold the tree up in a storm. Because we want these trees to be there a long time. We're going to open them up. They're going to get battered by storms. They need to have good anchorage roots. No good picking a tree that sat on a strange uh, mound of earth that was created from when it was planted or has grown out of a windblown stump. All of those have risks for windblown. So we want a tree that's showing signs of stability. Don't want trees that have got stress in them, so they're weeping a lot or they've got damage from previous harvesting. So typically avoid you avoid picking frame trees that are on the edge of racks. Those frame trees want to be in a row from the edge of the rack. They need to be in the core of the rack standing area, not near the area that's going to have extraction going past it, which is a shame sometimes because you can find some cracking frame trees on the edge of racks, but you can't choose them because they could get damaged. 
So you need to move into the edge. Look for trees that have got good canopy as well, trees that have got maybe 30, 40% canopy. And it varies. I've got a, a, a bit just up from here that's very poor canopy to start with, but pick the trees with the best canopy in the crop you've got. That's all you can do. Because again, you're looking for something that's a big sale, going to be blown around the wind. That'll help you put out anchorage trees and also it's going to produce a lot of seed, which will help the next process. And then once you find it, we paint a mark right around it so it can be seen from all directions because you're telling people, don't damage this tree, leave it standing, protect this tree, it's a special tree. Um, I think that's everything. You, in the slides you were showing, the pictures you were showing from with it, you were talking about enrichment planting. Um, yes. Partly because on those north facing slopes you don't get much Douglas region. Does the enrichment planting include productive broadleaves? Uh, yes, we've been planting beech and sycamore in dense, um, I call mass planting. So when we do underplanting, we try and mimic regeneration, if you like. So we plant at half to one meter spacing. Um, might plant, you know, 500,000 trees in a, in a group, whatever, but it's always a dense spacing, half to one meter. No intention to come back and maintain it, no intention to beat it up. Those trees have to survive out in the wild on their own. And um, we were just looking at some uh, um, Japanese red cedar that we planted a few years ago, just up from the office. And when you look at the site, you can't see it. If you pull away the vegetation, there they are. Um, and if you plant them dense enough, they will start to impact the vegetation around them quite quickly as they grow up. They'll start to canopy close. And when the vegetation falls on them, it's it's being shed, the loads being shared by a lot of trees nearby rather than that tree having to share all the load. So we plant at half to one meter spacing. And actually, if you look at the costs, planting is not that expensive compared to all the maintenance stuff you do. So if you can forget the maintenance, just focus on the planting. And you're not you don't want to keep going back and trying to find these groups to maintain them. You want them to grow away themselves and then reappear in five or six years' time above the vegetation, and then you can start to accommodate them within your thinning. Okay. Um, I had a question about um, the mensurational support for the work you're doing. Um, I think when you were talking about dodge, you mentioned plots. Um, question, what are you measuring, how often? And also, when you're removing the overstory trees, have you got a target diameter in mind? And does it differ between the Sitka and the Douglas? Let's take it as a uh, question of time. So it's really down to resource and time. What would I prefer to spend my time on? And for me, I think it's really important as a forester to spend the time on picking the right cheese and marking those those crops that are now at low density, valuable trees. I do bring in contractors to do the mensuration. We haven't got time to plot everything in our forests ourselves with our teams. Um, and all, all we do is measure what we call B6 plot survey. So we're just putting plots in, getting stat details about the standing crop. And then I, I produce a spreadsheet from that and I simply have a column where I take 20% of the standing volume to give me an idea of what I'm going to try and take out. I'm aiming really at 20% of the basal area, but just it's simpler to use volume because the contractor understands that. So the figure I sell on for each each part of the forest is 20% of the standing crop, unless I think I'm going to take more. So in that Douglas, I might have put 40% in, so I might be taking 40% out. So the information I get before we actually put it up for sale is simply B6 plot data. So it gives me crop data, it gives me basal area per hectare, individual basal area as well, so I can look at, well, basal area per hectare, if that's in the 40s, I'm not going to get regeneration from that yet. I need to bring that down. If it's at 25 to 30, well, that's good. I should be getting regeneration. I keep want to keep it there. So I can use that information to think about how much I want to take out as well. And then I sell it based on those B6 plots and I have a spreadsheet, which I'm happy to share uh, what it looks like. It's, it basically has information about what, what thinning method I want. So it's, I might say first thinning, line thinning, line and intermediate, alternate line, frame tree thinning. And then it'll say who's going to mark that. So it'll say fella select or forester mark. And then there might be other information. So it might say no wheels. So I want this to be winch, even if you could get uh, machines off the ground. 
they might say th other special things in there like i want some chevron fellings done and i'll, I'll plot where they're going to be we might have 100 200 rows of that for one year's thinning and the contractors it, we, by building up that long-term partnership has built up trust in what i'm saying so he's willing to go off that level of information to put a bid in and we, we spend quite a bit of time walking around both on his own and together we might spend a whole day two days looking at individual sites especially the difficult ones and we have you know we agree on what what's going to happen so he's bidding based on what i'm expecting when it comes to actually marking the crops on the crops i want to mark i'm just marking i'm not collecting any other mensuration information i don't have time to do that and do the marking and manage the beat i have but what I feel is important is that there are certain crops at that older end, at the lower density end, where we actually mark the trees. And I'm more interested about the tree that I want to remove and the direction it's being felled than any target diameter. I'm, I'm not operating target diameters at all. It's just too complicated for, for me, partly, and for my contractor. I'm more interested in the, just looking at the structural development of the forest by looking at what's working and picking out the trees that I think, well, if I don't take that this time, I'm not going to get to it. That tree and that tree need to come out to release that bit of regeneration. Or if I do this, I'm going to block myself out of those trees. They need to come out now. Or that tree needs to stay to give that area seeding. Or I want to keep that tree because it's a fantastic tree and you get this great view as you come up the road. And we want people to see it as they're walking that path. So I'm more interested in the trees, their location, what needs to come out for practical extraction than target diameter. I'm not saying target diamonds is wrong, it's just my approach. I, I just can't do everything and I, I feel that's more important to me. Mm -hmm. right. We do have, I'm sorry, we do have some permanent sample plots in both Dodd and Withup. Um, we don't revisit them very often, but they are photographed. Um, they've got individual uh, DBH of every tree that's in the plot. Um, where the plot is, we know that. And uh, we can use that information to monitor. Um, but we're only revisiting those every probably five to ten years, probably more like the ten-year category, because things don't change quick enough to warrant visiting more often than that. You, I feel anyway. Okay, we've had a thanks, Gareth. We've had a question, um, which I hope I'll get right, which is linked to the choice of the one in eight, followed by the alternate, put it, the alternating one in eight. Um, and the fact that you have these two interventions, is this, is this driven by stability primarily, or is it driven by, does it have any link to making the standing scale contract work more effectively? I think on steep ground, your first and second thinnings are the most expensive you will ever do, and they are almost certainly at a loss. Maybe not at the moment, I, I haven't tried to sell any on their own but they're the most expensive, whether they're a loss or not. So putting in lines for, for a skyline or winch is the most efficient way of thinning. It brings out the most timber in the most efficient way for that machine and that system. So those first two thinnings are line thinnings simply because of that, really. They have stability benefits, but it doesn't matter really because I can't use any other machine. Sometimes I have um, written into the long-term contract that we should winch only some coops where you could get a forward on harvester in but i'm concerned about stability and i feel that we can protect stability by skylining but there's a risk if we put a machine in we'll trample over the, the tree's roots and affect the potential stability of that crop so i've i've deliberately moved from harvester forwarder to winch uh, manual fell and winch on some sites to protect stability but predominantly on the steep sites is about making the first two things the most efficient and economic we can make them. Okay, thanks. Um, I've got a few questions. There have been three kind of linked to your mass planting. Um, if we can go back to that for a second. One, two that are very linked say, does this planting get you through bracken? And, and or bramble, and is the mass planting dense enough, adequate enough to get through browsing ground? Um, so in terms of bracken and bramble, we do have both of them on our sites, not always to the same density, because it depends on the overstory and the aspect. 
um, but quite a few of our sites have bracken and bramble. And I was most impressed when uh, I visited Delamere, oh, it must be 10 years ago now, but they'd done some mass planting after they'd visited uh, uh, Witherp or Dodd. And the forest there had done some mass planting and forgotten about it. And we went to visit it. And it was a really dense site. If anybody knows Delamere, the bracken is head high. It's, it's, it's serious stuff. We don't get bracken that high in the central lakes or the mountains, but it's serious stuff. And we went to look at these, these um, dense plantings he'd done quite a few years after he'd done them. He hadn't been back, done no maintenance to them. And they were, they were up through the bracken and had shaded it out. Um, so I, I really do think if you plant at half, half meter to one meter spacing, within a few years, you will start to suppress the vegetation. And when that vegetation falls on, even the young planting, it's falling and being supported by multiple trees rather than one tree. Uh, having to support all that stuff around it within two meters falling on it. There's what, four or eight trees all in that same area that are supporting the, 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 the vegetation as it falls down. And they do seem to pull up through it. And this, um, I, I haven't got the time to find it, but we, we were really impressed with the Japanese red cedar that we planted at half to one meter. When you look through the waist high vegetation, you couldn't see it. And I thought we'd lost it. But once you started stepping in and, and pulling apart, you can actually see it was level with the vegetation and they were all there still. So I, I think next year they'll be up above it. And the plots where we've we done Douglas fir have all, uh, Douglas fir under bracken, Douglas fir in bramble, they've all excluded the vegetation uh, and are now romping away and self-selecting and some of them are leading away and some are being uh, you know, shaded out. In terms of deer, I think like any regeneration system, any forest, or even, even if a clear fell restocking system, you do need to have good deer management if you've got deer. We have deer, we have roe and red, and they do give us some headaches in some places. Um, on steep ground uh, where you've got neighbor's land or you've got a, a, a village right up against the forest can be difficult. But we have, a fan, I have to say, a fantastic ranger team. They won't be listening, I don't suppose, to this, but they are fantastic, and I always tell everybody that. And, uh, you know, we can always shoot deer. We can shoot more deer. Uh, I have far more problems with sheep than I have deer. My ranger can shoot, our ranger just shoots deer and does a really good job and we have lots of regeneration. The problem we have is with sheep, which politically we can't shoot. We have to find them, gather them, find the hold, try and get them out, laser the farmers. So deer, not a problem really if you've got the right rangers, I don't think. Thanks, Gareth. Sorry, I have a previous question about the one in eight interventions I misunderstood. And the question was, why did, was there a reason for doing this as two interventions rather than one? So you were first thinking where you took one in eight. Oh, I see. Um, I, I think, it, it, yeah, I can see that. Um, I guess I'm still driven very much by that sense that I want to, I want, if I feel that those first two interventions are expensive. And so by doing, the line thinnings over two interventions means that I, I spread that in economic value across two interventions. I did line thinnings that will be one in four or something for the first intervention. I would be nervous about doing inter, intervening intervention uh, line things for the next intervention because there'll be everything be too close together. So I would be worried about stability at that point. So I think that alternate one in eight seems to be that good balance of stability and efficient and economic working. But hey, if you've got a forest, give it a try. It might work. I think experimenting is really useful, especially when it comes down to something we haven't mentioned is if you are managing the CCF, the bigger the areas, the better, because you get the opportunity to experiment. And if you lose a hectare to wind blow light, the beast from the east, but you've got 300 hectares that you're managing as a CCF, that one or two hectares or five hectares doesn't feel that big. But if you're managing 10 hectares under CCF, five hectares is half of your forest. So if you can manage more of the forest under CCF or don't manage it under CCF, you know, the more you can manage under CCF regime, the, the more you'll be able to adapt to and include wind blow in the system because you feel differently about it because of the area working, I think. Thanks. I would echo that, Gareth. Um, some questions, um, partly on soil health um, as a consequence of your management. But the first bit is your forest, for both the Dodd and with it, you're in the process of restructuring. When you 
completely got this multi tiered forest. Will, have you, do you plan to extract the larger timber in the same way in the future? And do you envisage having permanent extraction rights? I think um, on flat ground, permanent extraction racks are absolutely totally valuable because you need that space to get in. You could, I suppose, step away from an area for a while and see if they regenerated and then create a new extraction rack through the established um, understory. That's one way of doing it. But on our on our steep slopes, we you know we can't have permanent extraction racks in the same way. So it's not the same on a steep slope. But I think on on the areas that we've got permanent extraction racks, especially that area of uh, Witham, I think I would just keep them and carry on using them uh, because they do work and they give us that flexibility of being able to drop the big crowns into them uh, as well and, and know that they're always there. Um, what was the other half of the question? Was, oh, the yeah, big well, trees, what will you do in the future? Yeah. yeah. I think it is worth thinking, remembering that we are transforming our forests and the systems we use today are about transformation, which is why we use different systems to maybe European systems, which we all get taught at college and are fantastic systems, but those systems are being used on transformed forests and we are transforming our forests. And it might take us a hundred years. So I'm not really, I don't think in my lifespan, I'm gonna get to a point where we're not trans, we've finished transforming. So I probably don't have to worry about it, but I suspect our forests will always be different because we're in a windier climate as well. Um, but I do, I do see us, Partly because I want to keep, I think keeping those some of those big trees is really valuable. So even if it's 10 big trees a hectare, they're still going to be dumping out seed across that whole area. So if you then have a problem and the understory, I don't know, something happens to the understory, maybe it gets diseased, maybe it does blow over, maybe you have to clear fell it for some other reason, you can still leave your overstory trees because they'll be so wide apart and so established above the understory that they're individually stable and they'll be dumping seeds. So any gaps you get, there's always seed being dumped. Whereas if you wait for the understory to get that high, I feel there's a gap in between the under, the fact that removing the overstory and having the understory at an age where it's producing seed. So you get a gap in time where you aren't getting constant seed being dumped on the area. And finally, I think in the lakes, uh, visually having uh, big trees in the landscape is just fantastic. And even though we've knocked 30 to 40% off both the mature Douglas fir areas of Dodd and Witherb, they still look like forests from a distance. I can't believe every time we do it that I go back in and think, well, we can do it again. <laughs> it hardly looks like we've done anything. So I think we could bring them down to 10 or 15 or 20 trees per hectare and then just never take those out and we'll carry on then starting to focus on the, the next understory as being the main focus of harvesting and repeat the process. And then we'll keep 10 or 15 of those trees and eventually we'll have these really big old trees that may never get felled. They're there for the beauty, they're there for stability, they're there for sea production. Um, and you keep recruiting 10 or 15 from each and you'll probably lose one or two as well. But trying to keep some big trees, I think is really valuable. And to what extent do you think that this management has positive impacts on soil health? I'm not a soil scientist. So I think all I can say is um, when we look at the landscape around the forest, our forests are doing a great job on soil health, just having them there. Whenever we've had big storms in the Lake District, parts of valleys and mountains slip because there's no trees covering them and sheep grazing is just leaving them vulnerable to landslip. And some of those landslips then take out roads and the roads take out communities and the, and the flooding takes out communities. So I think having thinned forests and diverse structured forests on steep hills is really important for climate change and for storms. And so I think it will be for soils as well, because the soils are staying in one place, they're building. But like you asked before, Bill, putting some broadleaves into the mix, I think is a really good idea. So we have been trying mass planting of broadleaves, uh, mostly beech and sycamore in our Douglas fir mixes to try and get a broadleaf soil improver leaf leaf fall in the mix so it's not all needles it's also leaves as well from the broad leaves we've had a thanks for that. we've had a query about applying the approach you've used in Dodd and Wither let's say in somewhere like Western Scotland with them from Sitka when I'm reading this question I'm remembering that 
you've got blocks in the western part of your area which are on less tractable soils if, if that would be fair um, how is one is the question about the sort of capacity of soil to survive multiple passes of machinery is it well i think that's part of it and where you if you if you have a landscape where unthinned citrus spruce dominates, as it does in parts other parts of the west coast, but I'm thinking that you've got blocks, from what I remember, with let's say wetter soils and maybe more difficult soils, and how how have you approached using thinning on those? I don't think we have anything that's as wet or difficult or, or unthinned as perhaps parts of West Scotland. But I know in Kilda they've developed a, 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 um, a system of what I call variable, they, they would describe as variable density thinning, where they just accept, because again, you've got big areas that are managed. I think the area CCF around the reservoir is something like three or 4,000 hectares, one CCF area, and it's all in wind as a class five. And so they've adapted a, a system of thinning and accepting wind blow. So they thin anyway, and when it blows over, they clear it and they get regeneration. So I think you 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 can only take from other people's experiences things that work for you. You can pick and choose and try and build your own recipe if you like that works for you. But experiment. If you can have these big forests, then can you experiment on five or ten hectares, thin it, see what happens. If the timbers are value enough, can you sit a skyline on the side and not put machinery on the ground and winch it? Uh, to the roadside. It might be you don't go get as much value, but then you may be protecting the soils, allowing you to continue to thin and develop a system where you're getting regular income from thinnings, albeit not as much income as you would get from a smaller number of thinnings, but then your soil becomes so badly affected you can't then go back again. So I think you've got to try and think about different solutions. And, and where we've got wet soils in the blocks I look after, Winlatter uh, has got a few areas, well, I just think it's too wet to put a machine on. It's flat enough, but if I want to keep thinning it, then I'm going to have to do it with a skyline. And by incorporating into the whole forest thinning, which includes some clear fells, I can afford to do that. I think that's another way to go forward as well. Is is you can if you include a whole forest and its clear fells in a contract, then you can do some of the more expensive stuff because it's covered by the cost of the more valuable stuff. Okay, thanks. There's a technical question here, which we might get some help with, but well, you can answer um, this one, Bill. <laughs> uh, do it goes. Do you see a use for traction assist winches in your big tree scoop groundwork? Just say that again. I couldn't hear. Did you do you see a use for traction assist winches in your big tree scoop groundwork? Um, no. <laughs> I think it's a simple answer. The big cat skidder is doing a great job. I don't see any need of trying to get anything on the steep slope. So as long as you've got a road system that you can use, then uh, it's either the, a big skidder or we have done some winch work with skylines and, and high leading. We do actually a lot, lot more high leading than skylining. Uh, although the machines that we have can do skylining, the contractor's machine is mostly high leading because it's just quicker to set up. And sometimes if we've had to highlight big trees, they simply cut it in half and highlight, high lead it or winch it out in two parts. So uh, I don't no, I don't see a need to. I think quite happy with mix of skyline winch, which is typically, as many people will know these days, a large tract excavator system uh, and a big skidder that works well or a clam bunk big skidder is even better. OK, Gareth. We um it's one or two questions which i'm probably not going to take i'm going to sort of ask one last one before letting you go um do you want to talk at all you haven't said a great deal about the public reaction to this um or interest in what you're doing do, um how do how do people respond out with the sector I think um, there's a number of responses and uh, it does vary. Um, we've been thinning Setmurthy Forest, which is very near Cockermouth for the last year. 
again whole forest thinning most of it is harvest to forward a very little winch actually and not like and some big spruce but not that many big trees and uh, there's two sort of responses often is about loss of access which is doesn't has no bearing on whether it's ccf or not it's just any timber harvesting is going to cause a loss of access because we have to exclude people from the two tree length zone and where you know operations are active but then what we've had is some really positive responses from people who've seen who've gone then gone back into the areas when we've opened them up after we've thinned people have said how they love the thinned forest they can see further they feel less enclosed they feel that they can see light and, and maybe vegetation will grow um, and my experience of say from Ennerdale is that when we've talked to people about what parts of the forest they like and what parts they don't most people respond along the lines of whether what they're, they're noticing structural diversity rather than the species so they'll point to areas that are structurally diverse they've got gaps glades regen um uh, what do you call a pyramid of regen dead wood large trees small trees they'll talk about that as if it's natural and they love looking at that they love walking through it same species but unthinned they won't like that and they'll say that's not natural that's clearly a non-native conifer the other must be a native tree but actually it's the structure that's different the species is the same when we thin the uh, areas that are very visible like dodd and winlatter again it's mostly down to access the loss of access that people are unhappy with um, and squirrels people are concerned about how are the squirrels faring if we're taking out trees and we have to explain the processes we go to protect them and how creating uh, bigger frame trees with big cannabis means lots of seed so on the whole i think people are very understanding if we take the time to explain to them and we put up visitor information that tries to explain that as well as on the website and uh, i feel that by doing the whole forest thinning approach when we're in a forest it's typically that one forest out of the four then we can point them to the other forest and say you can go and recreate in those others thankfully we own you know enough to do that whereas if you're picking and choosing different crops based on what the market might want or you want to just thin the big ones or try and do the first thinning then you tend to find yourself in all the forests in a scattered approach and people get confused as to where you are whereas we stay in one forest for a whole year we might move around in that forest but at least anybody coming to that forest starts to get used to the fact that we are harvesting in there and they have to accept that they might have to modify their their recreation that day or they can go to one of the forests that we're not in so a um, bit of a mixed approach but um, i think there is a positive that comes out of thinning that people do recognize okay well i think we're about 10 minutes past the hour so um given the number of talks that you're having to do today, Gareth. I think we should let you go. I'd like to thank you on behalf of the CCFG and the Academy really very much for excellent presentation, a lot of practical insights, and I'm sure you'll get a lot of questions subsequent to this. So I'd like to thank everyone for attending um, and wish you all, everybody, all the best for the summer. This will be the last webinar um until the summer holidays are out of the way um and we hope to start again in late september